Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Good morning, good morning, everyone. This is David Parra, and our show is AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. We have a very important subject today. The name of the show today is A Nation of Immigrants. Um, and I'll, I'll be reading just a few lines that I wrote uh, as we start the program. Uh, the United States of America has been called the promised land, a city upon a hill, both taken from the Bible, concepts from the Bible, has been called uh, a melting pot, uh, and also a land of opportunities, a land of dreams. It's also been called a nation of immigrants. And these names have several impl uh, implications, one being, of course, the concept of immigration. I think immigration is, uh, is, is, is linked to America in, in, in every sense, just uh, due to the nature of this country, how it began, etc. The history of the United States has been a history of immigration. From the 13 colonies uh, and about 2.4 million in the 17th and 18th centuries to about 320 plus million in 2017. So welcome again. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. If you are listening by radio, please know that you can always uh, like our page. It's called AARP Facebook page, that is. AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection, uh, and we really, really invite you to like our page. I'm going to now introduce our guest for, the sh uh, for this show. Again, is a nation of immigrants. Uh, I'm going to start with Larry Sandigo, uh, and you are an attorney, uh, at, uh, immigration attorney, correct? That is correct. Welcome to our show, Larry. Thank you for having me. Yes, and then we have Frank Barrios. You're becoming a regular, Frank, with us. Uh, you are, I believe, uh, you're retired, correct? That's uh, and you might call it that. <laughs> yeah, well, so, that's that's right. Many people yeah. retire, but they don't really retire. Uh -huh. You uh, you were an engineer when in your profession, correct? That is correct. I, I uh, graduated from ASU with an engineering degree and uh, worked in uh, water resources almost all my life and served three years on the Central Arizona Project Board of Directors. Uh, and uh, just uh, I belong to a lot of groups. I'm past president of St. Vincent de Paul, past president of First Families of Arizona, Pioneer Cemetery Association, a lot of groups. And uh, I really support what you're doing here because uh, outreach to the, the Mexican, Mexican-American community out there is very important uh, because I'm also, I guess you'd call me a historian. I wrote the book, yes, the Mexicans definitely. of Phoenix. So. Mexicans of Phoenix, right? That's correct. Yes. And so the historical relevance of, of Mexican, Mexican American Latinos is very important. It's a big definitely. part of uh, who we are today. Definitely. Thank you and welcome to the show. Yeah. And Steve Jennings, you are my colleague of a few years now. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining our show you are the advocacy director of uh, aarp in arizona that's and right i don't i would not like to read all the the accomplishments and your past uh, experiences but uh, suffice to say that you bring uh, an amazing perspective to our show today you are uh, you your lineage goes back to europe definitely yeah correct? that's right that's my background that's um, right yeah. so now before we go into the, the what we would like to do today is basically review the history of immigration as one of the main elements of this show before we do that uh, i would like to ask each one of you if you can tell us because as i was preparing to this show i was realizing that the people that are going to be in this show including myself we represent uh, different backgrounds and countries. So if we can start with you, uh, Larry, uh, what is your family background? So I, my family is relatively new to the United States. 
my mom immigrated to the United States from Guatemala and my dad immigrated to the United States from Nicaragua. Um, I think prior to that, my grandparents grandparents uh, were um, from, they were Jews from Europe and then also largely indigenous people from Central America. Got it. Got it. Uh, how about you, Frank? Uh, you mentioned uh, when we before we uh, started the program, uh, Yugoslavia. Do you go back to Yugoslavia, your, your lineage in Mexico? Can you tell us a little bit? Right, I'm a mix of absolutely everything. <laughs> but my uh, my grandfather uh, came to Arizona in 1878. 1878 from uh, Yugoslavia, mm-hmm. and uh, he um, uh, settled in Phoenix. And I was just telling people that. Uh, he filed for citizenship in 1882 in Tombstone, Arizona. That was the same year they had the gunfight at the OK Corral. And, hmm. of course, he, he was dead before I was born, but I would have loved to ask him if he met Wyatt Earp or anything like that. And, and he married a Mexican woman who had been here, uh, part of Mexico since, uh, part of Arizona since it was part of Mexico. And uh, you can always say that uh, she didn't cross the border, the border crossed her. She right. was from this area, and uh, she uh, a long history. They were Martinez was her name, mm-hmm. and on my dad's side, both his parents uh, were Mexican citizens. My great my grandfather, his father was working in the United States when my dad was born, and then they uh, when the job was done, they all went back to Mexico. My dad. Uh, uh, came back to the United States. He was a U.S. citizen and uh, educated in Los Angeles, met my mom here, and uh, th- that's how I, I got started. And Steve Jennings, I mean, you sent me a little paragraph that I was totally amazed in reading. Would you uh, briefly tell us about your background? Uh, you know, obviously, you're a white person. <laughs> it's, only, it's only obvious. And you go uh, back to Europe. Can you uh, just relate to us? A little bit. I mean, uh, something that that we uh, that it would be interested for us to know about you uh, in your background. Well, one of the interesting things about my family on my father's side is we've had uh, men fight in all the major wars that ha- the United States has had, and we have a row of pictures in our family home of all those men in uniform right mm-hmm. up to the Second World War, and. Uh, and um, my father's uh, uh, English, uh, Irish, we're not quite sure which, that branch. But we have a Xerox of a deed from the mid-1600s in mm. what's now Connecticut that when uh, the, some of our earliest relatives we've traced in this country owned land. And um, my mother's side is Norwegian, and uh, I had an uncle do the lineage there, and I'm related to not only um, Lady Godiva, but somebody named uh, Sventi the Sea King. <laughs> And wow. my grandfather used to say the blessing before the meal in Norwegian. He was a Baptist minister. Now, how about a relative of, of yours uh, being nominated for the U.S. president? Oh, yeah. I'm related. Well, you know, my last name is Jennings, and I'm related to William Jennings Bryan, which was nominated by the Democratic Party three times to be president, lost every time, and argued against evolution at the Scopes trial in Tennessee. <laughs> that is amazing. So even just around this table, there's all kinds of... Uh, you know, backgrounds from different countries. And uh, we now have Lisa Magaña, and uh, you are, uh, let's see, uh, an associate professor at School of Transborder Studies at ASU. I'm actually now a full professor. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I'm interim director of the School of Transborder Studies. So That's awesome. Yes. Briefly, what is that Transborder Studies? You know what? I'm really proud to work at the school. It is a interdisciplinary school. We have a BA, a a bachelor's, a master's, and PhD now. And we study, um, I guess you could uh, replace the word transborder with transnational. Mm -hmm. And so to think about the idea that I could be here in Phoenix, but at the same time, still be very connected to what's going on in Mexico or Spain or Mm -hmm. other Latin American countries. And um, so we study border issues, immigration. Um, Myself, I'm a political scientist, so I study Latino politics and the connection between that and immigration. The school's interdisciplinary, so we have historians, um, we have people that do public health, we have anthropologists. So it's a really, as you can imagine, a, a really 
fascinating, interesting, um, challenging, <laughs> rewarding time <laughs> right. to be part of this school. I'm so really you, proud of it. You do have a PhD, uh, you do have a master's, and then you have a BA. Mm -hmm. so you have all kinds of... Uh, Got all kinds of stuff. stuff. Le letters <laughs> I can attach to my name. But I always say my the one that my mom was most impressed with mm -hmm. is when my name had an MRS at the beginning. Mrs. <laughs> uh -huh. When I got married. Oh, wow. <laughs> She now, was most excited about that. I, I, I saw Cal, Cal, uh, Cal Poly Pomona. I went to Cal Poly Pomona yeah, for undergraduate, and then my master's and PhD were, was at the Claremont Colleges, Claremont uh, Graduate School in California. Now, tell us a little bit about your background. We're talking about the, the country, America, the United States being a nation of immigrants. Mm -hmm. I'm an immigrant. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, feel, I think that everyone's really an immigrant. I agree. Uh, uh, how, can you tell us just a little bit about your family sure. background? My dad is from, uh, he passed away a long time ago, but was from Mexico, came in unlawfully uh, when he was very young and migrated from, uh, first into New Mexico and then California and grew up in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And he started off as a fruit picker mm -hmm. in San Dimas, California. God, My God. mom, um, her parents um, were second generation, so that her, I guess her great no, her grandparents would be Mexican, but mm -hmm. her parents were born in the U.S. My mom was born in the U.S. Right. And, um, yeah, came from a very working class background, my family. And um, so it's, I'm particularly proud myself to have these degrees. My mom and dad of did course. not um, attend higher ed. They didn't really understand what I was doing. Why, why don't you get a real job or, you know, <laughs> why don't you get a, a, a doctorate that makes money? That would be my, my mom said. So, so I'm really proud. When did you move to Arizona? You know what's so funny? I have to tell you a story. Um, I was I had gotten my PhD and was looking for positions in academia. And I my area, this was 20 years ago, I studied um, immigration and Latino politics. And I'm like, Arizona? What's going on? And who cares about immigration <laughs> and Latino politics in Arizona? And so when I interviewed here, I had the best interview because I didn't want the job. Mm -hmm. And then I got the job because <laughs> I was incredibly, I didn't want it. And it turned out to be one of the best things I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I would like to go around again and ask, so, and actually, you know, not everyone has to answer, but whoever wants to. I have a sense that a nation of immigrants has different meanings to different people. Would you agree and why? I mean, I'm sure that the people from, with a, a European background, well, it'll, it'll mean something to them a little different than perhaps Latinos or uh, Asian. Uh, or do you think, or I mean, do you think it means the same thing to everyone? being no. a nation of immigrants? What do you think, Frank? Well, I, I, I don't think it means the same to everybody. Everybody views it differently. And uh, uh, it and, and um, one of the, the, the things that made the United States great was the ability for immigrants to come together and, and create the United States, even though there was a lot of, it wasn't perfect and there was a lot of turmoil. Mm -hmm. And here in the United States, uh, there are people that say, yeah, I'm German, but I'm an American. The ability sort of north of the equator <laughs> to come together to create great things is, uh, uh, has happened in the northern hemisphere, maybe not so done so well in the southern hemisphere. Right. And you know the uh, 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 this is uh, some people call the uh, democracy of this country as an experiment, right? We're perfecting the union, so that means it's not perfect yet. There's all kinds of th things that are taking place. So uh, let's go on our first break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the history of immigration as it is uh, stipulated in the Constitution, first of all. And then we'll see how uh, the different waves of immigrants that came to this country. So stay with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Welcome to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection, and today we are addressing a nation of immigrants. A nation of immigrants. So 
let's get to the meat of this. Uh, we want to uh, begin to talk a, a, about the history of immigration in this country. Obviously, the history of America is the, a history of immigration, uh, I think is very obvious. Uh, Larry, would you mind uh, helping us uh, to kind of walk us through the concepts of immigration as uh, they are stipulated in the Constitution, if they are, and I'm sure they are, uh, and I'm sure there's been an uh, it's been evolving, obviously, uh, at the different times. So let's go. Uh, you have a, a concept of, uh, in your PowerPoint that you sent to me, the Naturalization Act of 1790. But before then, can you kind of help us understand what was the understanding of immigrants in those days? Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. And I do want to, before we delve into the history of immigration, is to recognize that there were people here before anyone came to the, any Europeans came to the United Definitely. States and that the indigenous people and the Native American tribes had been here long before. And so I just don't want the, us to lose that perspective when we talk about being a nation of immigrants. Definitely. Uh, so, you know, we were, the United States was colonized by the British Empire and then during the amending of the of the Constitution, the creation of the Constitution, there wasn't really talk of like immigration in terms of who could enter the territory, but was rather of who could become a citizen. So and the main issue then in those years, it was not necessarily of who could come, but who could be a citizen. Yes. Okay. And what the Constitution established was that it gave um, Congress the the mandate to establish uniform rules of naturalization. And so, you know, early on it was you had to be a white male, you had to have resided a certain amount of time, you had to, um, sometimes there were often uh, property requirements that you had to own land. And it wasn't until the 14th Amendment that it was really that anyone who was born in the United States um, was a citizen of the United States. An important exclusion from that word Native Americans. They were not considered to be under the sovereignty of the United States, and so mm -hmm. they were not granted birthright citizenship. What years are we talking about here? So the, the laws about um, naturalization and, and who could become a citizen, those were largely developed in the 1780s and the 1790s. The 14th Amendment wasn't until um, 1868. And Again, those are all laws related to naturalization. It wasn't until after the Civil War that we saw any laws really that um, governed who could actually enter the United States. So what we would think of today as immigration laws. So when, you know, you and I had a phone conversation sure. and you, uh, we, you talked to me about the concept of we did it the right way. Some people claim to have done it the right way. Others don't do it the right way. Can you elaborate just a little bit on that? Mm -hmm. So many times in the public narrative, we hear people say, oh, my family did it the right way. Mm -hmm. My family legally followed the laws and when they came to the United States. Okay. But if your family came to the United States prior to like the 1870s, there were virtually no laws that governed who could enter the United States. And so there wasn't a quote unquote right way of doing it mm -hmm. because – almost any, anyone was allowed in without any sort of uniform laws or applications. I mean, immigration was taking place left and right. Yes. I mean, uh, people from Europe were migrating to Mexico, Spain. I mean, even before they came to to this side of uh, uh, the country. So, so you're saying that in the beginning, migrating was not the issue. Coming was not the issue, but who would be considered a U.S. citizen? Yes. So the Naturalization Act of 1790, is that the one you're, you're saying that, again, it has to do more with who is considered a U.S. citizen as opposed to who can come to the country? Yes. Okay. What is the Alien and Sedition Act of 1798? So that was, a, that was an act related to who could be deported from the United States. So who could be thrown out, basically. Still, not who could come in, Correct. but who could be deported. Yes. And what triggered that uh, concept of deporting people? During this time period, like the, the nation is new. Right. It's like 15 years old. We're trying to figure out who was a loyalist, who was still loyal to Great Britain. Um, and so I think it had to do with those sort of elements of figuring out the loyalties of the people who lived in the United States. Okay. And uh, you state here that uh, people were excluded, like prostitutes, criminals, lunatics, 
public charge uh, anarchists and people with tuberculosis. So at, at that point, we've jumped ahead to like the 1880s. And so the mm-hmm. first time that there was a law that related to excluding people based on ethnicity was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Yeah. And I actually brought a copy of the act. And I know you would. You're an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> So it says, whereas in the opinion of the government of the United States, the coming of Chinese laborers to this country endangers the good order of certain localities within the territory thereof. So it doesn't expand on that. But what it does is it says we do not want Chinese laborers coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. There is some historical context to that, but it's the time when we see a single ethnicity or race saying we you are undesirable to come here is that the first time that we see this uh, aspect of immigration uh, based on ethnicity i believe so so. if i could add to that um, if you want to understand immigration law one way to think about is after the civil war a lot of laws are passed to essentially solidify um, laws so immigration interstate trade a lot of taxes these laws become um, more federal Um, and more sort of um, focused in its scope. And so immigration, the passage of laws, really starts after um, the the Civil War. You start to see these types of laws that are passed. And the other point, if I may add Mm -hmm. to your wonderful observations, is that we always want to keep in mind that immigration law always, and we get into trouble here in Arizona, is passed at the federal level. Mm -hmm. States cannot create their own immigration laws and um, that's really important to think about, it. and partly because of after the Civil War, states had their own ideas about what we should do about immigration. And so that's something we really do not want to, we want to keep that in mind. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, and I would say after the Chinese Exclusion Act, the next, I guess, acts that sort of focus on a particular demographic would be in the 1920s, right, the quota limit yes. laws. So in the 1920s, um, you'll notice immigration, a lot of it's, a lot of times, many times, I should say, um, are based on notions of nativism or that these people are changing what it means to be American. And so in the 1920s, two laws were passed that essentially excluded, and it even says we're going to exclude anybody that's not the same as the founding fathers, which means we're only going to let in Western, white, European Protestants. Okay, So people that were Jewish, Catholic, Eastern, Eastern European, um, these people were highly, highly um, discouraged from entering the U.S. And so, um, you know, let's keep in mind that we're talking about immigration, but at the same time, Mexican is still not an issue, right? Mm-hmm. We're talking about European immigration, um, but again, Mexican doesn't come into being a particular issue that's restricted until, I would say, 1980s, we start the 86 Act. So, so Mexicans are not an issue yet because why? They were, they were not coming in in big numbers or, or, or what? Um, well, I, would, I, you know, I can't generalize yeah. for all, but part of it was um, somewhere on a temporary basis. Um, we're, we're pretty new still. It's this area of... Um, so still Mexico had just essentially um, was where we are right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- this, again, um, um, I'll let you go ahead. But yeah, labor still very much back and forth. Uh, I just would point out that in the early years uh, from the turn of the century, 1900s, uh, in Arizona, other states may have been different, but it was like there was not a border mm-hmm. here. People could cross from Mexico, from Sonora. Sonora and Arizona were almost one to the Mexican people. They could come across in, in Phoenix. There were barrio areas where people spoke only mm-hmm. Spanish. And, and uh, there was a need because of labor. Yeah. They, they provided an important uh, – the immigrants would cross and they would provide labor. They'd get a job. And, and the, everybody was happy uh, with that. And uh, it was uh, a huge – in. but again, I might point out – uh, they were from Sonora, mm. primarily. And uh, I once talked to some people that said that actually some of the Mexican people would would be, um, would be d- segregate themselves from people who came from other parts of Mexico. <laughs> 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 because it was Sonora in Arizona was just like Arizona was part of Sonora. You could cross the barrio areas where you spoke uh, Sonoran, if you will, because of culture mm. uh, and your foods, everything. It was just like a, an extension of Sonora. That changed. 
that did change later. When we're saying that uh, immigration has been uh, in the con- uh, part of the history, uh, I mean, throughout the history, we don't want to see it as just as a standalone thing. Other things are happening that are triggering, it, triggering immigration, right? Can, can we say, uh, I mean, I'm sure it was the uh, jobs, it's, uh, the economy. I'm, I'm sure it's not happening as a standalone item. What is going on? as the country's evolving that requires people to come in and then all of a sudden we don't want them, now we want them. What, what is happening other in, in the full scope of, of the development of the country? I, I think it's very much tied to what was happening in the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. So you see a, a wave of um, Jews coming from Russia because the Russian empire is instituting pogroms. It's like specifically singling them out for, for persecution. Mm-hmm. And so you see... A rise of not necessarily it's something about the United States that drew them in, but rather I need to get out of Russia. Okay. And the United States has always been this beacon of hope of like we will welcome you regardless of of faith and um, other things that other countries very much um, persecuted on that basis. Mm. So, so I, I think you know even we see like um, so religious grounds and economic grounds like the most I guess famous example would be like the potato famine in Ireland. Mm -hmm. A lot of Irish come to the United States as a result of that. Um, And so it's I, I so think twofold, it's, there's uh, turmoil in their own country, and then there's this n- noted, uh, news that in America there's, there's uh, hope, there's a land of opportunity, so that to combine and then move people to make that journey, so to speak. Yes. To migrate. If I may add to that. Yes. So um, one of the things I always tell my students to think about is comparing traditional European immigration to what we refer to now as contemporary immigration, which is Mexican Mm -hmm. or Latin American. And so think about the differences. You have groups that come in for a particular reason, like a war would be Mm -hmm. another one. Mm -hmm. And then these groups stay in the U.S., right? And then they, what we say, assimilate, right? And so I'll hear, why didn't why didn't you people come in the right way like my grandparents did? And I want to say that this is a very different experience here, mm-hmm. particularly in the Southwest. This was once Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, you have people that are obviously still arriving, so that notion of assimilation is going to be very different. Mm-hmm. I would even say phenotype. We don't look like the founding fathers. Mm-hmm. And so to, to compare the two... Um, you know, immigration on the East Coast versus what's going on. Is that here. ignorance? No, it's not ignorance. Is that ignoring the facts? No, it's not what ignorance. Is it? I just think that, um, and I'll be honest, um, some of the rhetoric that we hear today, political, political rhetoric, makes that comparison that the immigrants that come in, they, why, why don't they get in line? Why don't they come in the right way? Mm-hmm. That same narrative doesn't exist, you know? And um, I think there's a lot, of, um, a lot of misinformation that's put out there that people like to believe. I'm going to go negative here. Um, this idea that immigration is out of control, we know is absolutely not true, that it has actually gone down, that Asian immigration has actually exceeded Latin American immigration. And so this narrative of the wall is somehow going to fix immigration. Um, I think people like to believe this is what is going on because it's politically easier to get this kind of information out there. We have to go on, on our second break. Uh, you're listening to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection, A Nation of Immigrants. We'll be right back. Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection, a great conversation on the subject of a nation of immigrants. Uh, so in the uh, history of immigration, at some point we start getting quotas, correct? And then if you can help us, Larry, to also bring the concept of refugees, where does that come from and uh, laws, et cetera? Well, I think Lisa had earlier touched on the the issue of quotas and when that enacted. Lisa, could you? In the mid tw- uh, early 1920s. Mm-hmm. And so I think... During the time period right before that, there was a spike of immigration Mm -hmm. from Eastern and Southern Europe. And a lot of Italians and Russians and and people from those countries, and largely those countries were not Protestant. Mm. 
and they were not of the quote unquote like original stock of Americans who had already the founding fathers, the founding fathers. Um, And so laws were enacted that said, we're going to establish a quota, meaning your country can only get. and, And what they did was they said, it's a certain percentage of what, of the nationality that was previously represented in the U.S. Mm. So what it ended up doing was that there was high concentration of visas available to people from Great Britain, from Northern and Western Europe, and then a very low number of visas available for, for, to people from Eastern and Southern Europe. Mm-hmm. These quotas did not apply to Mexico or the Western Hemisphere. It was because at that time the immigration is coming from Europe. What year is this again? Uh, is it, this early in uh, 1900s? 1920s. Yes. Wow. So so even in, in early 1900s, the issue of uh, Lat, uh, immigration from Latin America and Mexico is still not a big, a big deal, not a big issue yet. Yeah. 1930s, we have the first uh, Great Recession, Depression. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's around this time that I would suggest that um, the Mexican national, um, we have the first... Um, Um, repatriation of Mexican nationals. And part of it was that the president at the time um, attributed the depression to the Mexican national. So they started a essentially a, a, a deportation operation of those Mexican and Mexican-Americans that could not provide documentation and they were sent to Mexico. Yeah, I, I would add, uh, I don't know if you know, Dr. Santos Vega mm-hmm. worked at uh, ASU for many years and a very prominent professor wrote the book, uh, Worm and My Tomato. And it was basically uh, his story of how he was deported. He was born in the United States. His mother was born in the United States. They were both picked up and deported into Mexico and later came back and contributed greatly to Arizona, became a a Ph.D. professor, taught at ASU. And um, uh, he's still alive. He's in his, uh, I think, 90s now. But uh, uh, again, uh, they... During the Depression, work was scarce. The idea was to deport anybody mm-hmm. that uh, uh, they thought might not be a U.S. citizen. And even if they had brown skin, they would say you're not a U.S. Right. citizen. Now, if Mexicans or Mexican-Americans are being deported, that means that there were many uh, already here. Uh, could, could, could you say something about the Mexican Revolution, Frank? Did that bring in a lot of people from Mexico oh. fleeing that those uh, problems. There. Absolutely. The many people during the Mexican Revolution uh, were losing their homes uh, uh, and the people were coming across it was a uh, it was a, a war and a war you have refugees and the, just as you see in Syria today and these other places uh, people pouring into other countries and that's exactly what happened in Arizona during the Mexican Revolution uh, uh, there I in my my book that I, I wrote you see many pictures of families living in tents uh, those were refugees and and many of those had homes and viable lives but the revolution chased them across the border mm. just and again all you have to do is look around in the world today you see exactly uh, the same thing that is happening today so the bulk of the mexican population that came to this country due to the mexican revolution that's the ones that were sent back including some a uh, U.S. citizen of Mexican descent, I understand. 1940s, uh, World War II, there was a labor shortage. So okay. guess what? We need to recruit mm-hmm. uh, right. cheap labor from Mexico. And, and part of it was the Bracero program. Mm. Lucy mm. defined as helping hands. Uh-huh. And so the Bracero <laughs> program, um, you know, uh, obviously many, many, um, uh, not just Mexicans, but other, you know, Barbados and Jamaica and others um, were recruited to the mainland for um, labor needs. But then in the 1950s, Uh, with returning soldiers, another sort of economic recession. This led to the greatest uh, deportation operation um, mm-hmm. called Operation mm-hmm. Wetback, right, which right, another, right. Okay. which was actually over several years and in the millions people were um, deported. 
So the one you mentioned, Frank, uh, in the Great Depression times, that's the one that Dr. Santos Vega experienced? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Wow, we have someone alive that was re deported being a, yeah, an American citizen, and I know him too. Oh, He's a great, guy, a great man. He wrote a book, uh, Mexicans in Tempe, correct, Frank? That's Oh, he's written many books. Uh, yeah. The Worm in My Tomato is just one, but he has several books he's written, uh, Mexicans in Tempe, and, and uh, several he's written history of barrio areas in Phoenix also. Yeah, and I, I can see now that your slide, uh, Larry, you said Operation Wet back in 1954, the federal government rounded up and deported one million Mexican immigrants, as well as some legal immigrants and U.S. citizens of Mexican descent. So... Could we say that at this point, the immigration issue is no longer the immigrants from Europe necessarily, and the attention turned more to the Latin America Mexican immigration? Yes. Any, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Anyone? Um, I, absolutely. We have uh, President Trump. I think this was one of his main agendas when he ran for president. Remember, he announced that Mexico sending their rapists and murderers and uh, one wants to and still wants to create a wall that Mexico is going to pay for. Uh, not very likely. But, uh, yeah, this is definitely immigration is a big agenda. Mm -hmm. And particularly, obviously, um, focusing on Mexican and Latin American. Could Do we know where immigration uh, stands in terms of uh, people from Europe? Do, are they still quotas, no quotas? Do we know what the... Or, or do we have just a standardized way of coming to the country, becoming U.S. citizens for everyone across the board? We do have a standard process for anyone wanting to immigrate to the United States, regardless of country of nationality. Okay. Um, there are still numerical – quotas isn't the right word because it isn't the same sort of concept. But um, it's – for example, a lot of times – especially in regard to Mexican immigration, it said, like, why isn't it done the right way? So if I'm a Mexican, if I'm a U.S. citizen and I've got a brother in Mexico and I file a petition for him mm -hmm. to come to the United States, it will take about, like, over 30 years mm. for, for my brother in Mexico to be able to immigrate legally to okay. the United States. Whereas if I am... My, a U.S. citizen, my brother lives in France and wants to immigrate. It does not take that long. Okay. And so there are still, the process is the same for everyone, but in terms of... Requirements perhaps are different. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of those, you know, some requirements are like unofficial. Like, for example, okay. immigration attorneys know that if you have a client from any Middle Eastern, Arab, or Muslim country, Muslim majority country, that it will take longer. Mm you know, for security concerns. And just to reiterate, you are an immigration attorney, right? Yes, I am an immigration <laughs> attorney. Uh, before we go on our, our third break, I, I wanted us to touch a little bit about uh, the Refugee Act of 1980 created a domestic resettlement program, and then the 2002 National Security Entry Exit Registration System. Can you just briefly elab elaborate that? And then we're going to go to the executive uh, actions in our last segment, including DACA. Okay. Uh, so prior to World War II, um, we did not exempt refugees from the quotas that already existed. It was what happened in Europe that led us to say we do not want this to ever happen again. Mm. And so that's when we first, um, the United Nations was created, um, you know, the UN Convention on Refugees. The United States said we should let people in based on humanitarian reasons mm. that are not subject to the quotas okay. that had previously, the United States had turned away people who we would have said were refugees who were persecuted, who many of them died mm. because of the quota system. So, it, you know, it, it evolved in 1980. They passed the Refugee Act that kind of standardized the refugee resettlement process in the United States of, you know, once a refugee arrives, who do they go to? How do they, are they helped? Things like that. Um, after 9-11 um, is when there was a an immense amount of scrutiny on people coming from um, Arab countries, Muslim majority countries, or Middle Eastern countries. Mm -hmm. And the program that you just mentioned was one where people literally had to register. Mm -hmm. um, they, immigrants from, they produced a certain list. Certain countries, right? From certain countries. I think it was all Muslim majority countries in like North Korea. They had to physically go to a, like a, 
immigration like officer and register that they were here in the United States. So did they get a letter uh, requesting or asking them to do that? Or was that something I don't remember? Was that something in the news? It was in the news. Okay. Um, it is. It especially came up in the news again recently in January when there was a new idea of like this Muslim, Muslim registry yeah. mm-hmm. uh, in the Muslim yeah. ban yeah. because we had already done something similar to that where we required uh, people from Muslim majority countries to register their presence in the United States. You have here in your PowerPoint terminated in 2016. Yes, so under under President Obama, that system terminated. People did not have to register any any longer. Correct. Immigration law is federal. <clears throat> in about a minute, uh, the, what's the concept here? I think uh, Lisa had touched on it earlier, is that states had tried to, right after World War II, to create their own laws related to who could enter th- their state. Okay. And then this was like, no, the immigration is a federal law, meaning Congress has to regulate it. If you remember in the Constitution, Congress is given the mandate right. to regulate naturalization, and that was expanded to mean immigration in general. So you have, is it she, uh, Lung versus Freeman? Mm-hmm. And then you have Arizona versus the United States. So are these two attempts by states to uh, set uh, immigration laws? Uh, so the original case that is from 1876 where the U.S. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. Immigration law is federal. And I gave the example of Arizona versus the United States <clears throat> because Arizona is a state that tries to regulate immigration. Okay. And it keeps getting struck down of saying, Arizona, you cannot pass state law about immigration. That is a federal issue, and it's a federal law. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Right on time. Thank you, Larry. We are going to go on our last break. Uh, This is AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. We'll be right back. Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection, and the name of the show today is A Nation of Immigrants. And we're time is flying. So let me go uh, to Steve. Uh, Steve, uh, I told my wife uh, some time ago, I says, uh, Steve Jennings is, is, is the most uh, Latino American. <laughs> so he's very, very in tune to culture. Can you just uh, in maybe a minute tell us uh, your exposure to the Latino culture and how you process it, how it went, how it, how, what, you know, how has, has it been in your experience? Well, uh, I moved to Arizona in 2010 from Providence, Rhode Island, and one of the people I worked with at the legislature there, you know, I'm a lobbyist and was working with AARP there, was a Dominican senator who was one of the first Dominican senators in the United States, and um, uh, I got uh, exposure to some of the culture of, uh, you know, the Dominican Republic and its peoples who are the newest immigrants now to that. That's an immigrant city. It had Italians and Irish and... and, uh, um, and, uh, you know, I jumped at the chance when AARP, when the job opened up out here in Arizona, because I had lived in Salt Lake for 14 years and, and many of my friends were Chicanos, you know, Mexican-Americans and, um, and uh, just the enriching experience of getting to participate in any way in, uh, in the Hispanic culture here. It's been great. And, and as well as the Native American cultures, too, it's part of the opportunity of being an American is being exposed to all these different peoples and how lucky we are and how how you know we can become better people and and bigger people by learning from other can you, people can you say that you said better and bigger is that what has happened to you i mean you had not been exposed to latino culture as much now you see a lot here in arizona so in your experience, uh, you you say that it basically enlarges your view, your heart. It's an opportunity, yeah. Right. It's an opportunity right. to become an educated person, and that's a lifelong experience, right? And it's a mission in life that you do, yeah. and the more you can understand and interact with people that are different with than you, then the better you are, yeah. hopefully. He's the, only, he's the only person that calls me David. <laughs> <laughs> and when we went down to Nogales and you were talking to people in Spanish, that's how they were saying your name. Right. <laughs> and let me just say, I apologize to all the people People from Central America, from people to South Americans, because in the U.S. they lump every Latino person as Mexican, and I think a lot of people do not like that. True. Yes, do not <laughs> like it, and and we we apologize for that. But uh, I mean, it, it, they just 
put everybody on the same boat. They call them Mexicans, right? That, that's why the term Latino was uh, incorporated. <laughs> right. Latino covers to, to everybody kind of cover in the more. Hispanic world. And even though people, <laughs> people, some people don't like Latinos or don't like Hispanics, and you know. But anyway, I think we kind of understand where this coming it comes from. Uh, before we move on to end this show, um, let's talk about executive action. So you have uh, immigration laws being done, obviously, by the federal government. Some states have tried to legislate on immigration. They, they were taken to the, the Supreme Court and, and they, uh, you know, they t took the case and, and strike down some of the provisions, for example, of uh, SB 1070. What is the concept of executive action and, and who has uh, used it? And then now in our times, uh, we're dealing with another big, big important issue, which is the DREAM Act, then DACA, and then DAPA. Uh, Larry. So the, the Constitution gives the executive branch, so the president, the power to execute the laws. So the president doesn't create the laws. Congress does, and president, the executive branch, carries them out. Right. And in that, it was given. The president was given the um, the power to do executive action to direct agencies on how to execute laws in terms of priorities or um, discretion and things like that. I, executive action refers to many, many laws, right, and even right. that are not related to immigration. Got it. We see it most recently in the news about immigration because uh, of the DACA program. So President Obama issued executive action creating this program that what it does was um, a formalization of prosecutorial discretion. Mm -hmm. So the agency always has had the, the discretion and the, the legal backing to say these people are a priority, these people are not our priority. Okay. And so the executive action was a creation of a program around the people at the, who were not a priority at all in terms of executing the laws related to immigration. First of all, DACA refers to Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival. It was right. an executive order. There was an attempt to pass some comprehensive immigration, didn't go through, with the Gang of Eight, and it was oh, this, right? right? And um, so that didn't get passed, but we had to do something about these dreamers. And these were kids that were brought to the U.S. very young, through no fault of their own. That's important because the, the courts have usually ru ruled that you can't punish children for the actions of their parents. Right. And so what DACA did was give these kids kids essentially a temporary work permit and the promise that they would not be removed actually if you come in unlawfully it's removed not deported i don't know if you knew that but you would not be um, removed from the u.s um but it has to be um you have to update right your um your status and so most recently um president trump said we are stopping this DACA program and i'm now making congress because it's no it's my executive order is that i'm stopping it Right. And now Congress is responsible for doing something about these 800,000 wonderful adults um, right. that are truly if I have many DACA students that are truly amazing. Right. Well, if there's a group that uh, deserves to, to, to stay here and are like the best people to stay. Yeah. Are the DACA uh, I, folk, you know, kids, because there's uh, a lot of support. Seventy yeah. percent support um in terms of polling regardless of partisanship so that's yeah. it's really well you know my son mary a daca a daca really? young beautiful lady yes and obviously now she's uh, under another situation uh, but uh i'm telling you this this people are the best yeah you know? I, I i think that the the problem doc uh, that that hasn't been resolved because both sides of the equation are supporting DACA mm -hmm. students, but they they try to use it uh, as a uh, what's the word I want to use wedge. Um, a, a wedge, wedge. Yeah. to get other things done. And so every time they would bring it up, uh, one side or the other would bring things they want uh, uh, there, mm -hmm. and so it never went anywhere. But the support is there, uh, total support from both sides to do something about the DACA student, but it's politics that seems to get in the way of it. You know, I, I want to read something that uh, I believe you wrote uh, in the PowerPoint. Let me see if I got this paragraph correctly, because it basically summarizes the three branches of government, the way it operates. Uh, an executive action. The Constitution delegates the executive, uh, the execution of laws to the president. Executive action refers to orders or memoranda that the president gives 
to his executive agencies on how to execute a law. Uh, similar force of law uh, is that of a law passed by Congress, but Congress can pass an overrid, uh, overriding law, but subject to veto. Supreme Court can overturn them, executive laws, not create laws. And I do want to clarify that president after president has used executive action. I'll give you an immigration-related okay. ac- executive action. Was uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's executive order related to the roundup and internment of Japanese Americans in World War II? So that was not passed by Congress. That was, a, that, was pa- that was initially done by the president. I didn't know that. Wow. Okay. Wow. Uh, any others? Uh, I mean, I, I have here that Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation mm-hmm. Proclamation, mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's Japanese internment camps, Dwight Eisenhower's National Guard deployment to Little Rock, and then the latest Barack Obama's Defer Action for Childhood Arrivals. Mm-hmm. And our current president is also a, a really big fan of issuing well, he's, executive action. He's done action. many, of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, let's uh, kind of uh, end our show. Um, Immigration, it's a big, a big issue. I mean, uh, the more you get into it, the more you research and the more you see the country, it's a, it's, a, it's a very important issue. In the last two minutes that we have, can each of you kind of tell us where should we go or where should the country go? Where should the country be? What lessons have, should we have learned to make this a more you know, a more peaceful uh, and be so that we can coexist in, in, a, in a better way because this, this issue seems to, st- to stick around for a long time. Yeah. I, as a political scientist here, I'm going to say that this um, agenda that's anti-immigration, it's going to backfire and it's short-sighted because in terms of Latino politics, Latinas are the fastest growing globally. And as they age, as they become politicized, we see that the anti-immigration stuff actually politicizes these groups. And so it's going to backfire um, as more and more Latinos voting, grassroots mobility. It is in the country's best interest to welcome and facilitate the this uh, the immigrants absolutely uh, upper studies mobility if studies you will. consistently show that the presence of immigrants in the economy is a net gain economy. regardless of status mm. it's the same reason why you want tourists to come to arizona right it's good for the economy steve we have a program social security medicare that are uh, challenge you know experiencing financial challenges how do you see the connection of the two with this new group of uh, people that could potentially help, you know, finance with their taxes and et cetera. Well, yeah, you know, uh, these are hardworking. You know, when you leave all your all your friends and all your supports in your country and you come to a new country, you work hard. And if you look at, it doesn't matter what group it is, these are hardworking people that are contributing to the economy and we're all enriched because of it. Thank you. Uh, we only have a few more seconds. Frank, what would be your last words? What would be the, a good scenario that to, for us to move uh, forward? Well, first, you've got to solve DACA. That's the most important thing facing us. Secondly, compromise, compromise, compromise. Come together, the two parties, and find a solution to immigration that can work. There are uh, groups, agriculture is on the verge of going under in the United States without labor. And, and it can be solved if the two sides come together. So that's very important. A few seconds, Larry, conclusion. Any law legislation that's passed needs to start with the assumption and proven fact that immigrants and immigration are good for us. They're good for us. Thank you so very much. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we're going to have more programs on this issue. This was just the first one. Thank you so very much for joining. This was AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.